in the American. Good evening, and welcome to Worcester Historical Museum series of presentations focusing on John Hancock, Worcester, and the American Revolution, a series of two presentations and the publication of a brochure describing our walking tour of revolutionary Worcester. I'm Bob Stacy, site manager of the Salisbury Mansion, Worcester's only historic house museum and a part of Worcester Historical Museum. Tonight, we welcome Professor Robert Allison of Suffolk University, who will talk to us tonight about John Hancock and the role of Worcester as a center of revolutionary activity. This evening's presentation has been made possible by support from the Worcester Arts Council, a local agency, and the Mass Cultural Council, a state agency, as well as a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Exploring the Human Endeavor, and the Worcester Together Fund, a joint effort between the Greater Worcester Community Foundation and the United Way of Central Massachusetts in partnership with the City of Worcester. The virtual Revolutionary Worcester Walking Tour, available from Worcester Historical Museum's website, is a partnership of the museum, WPI, and Digital Worcester. Robert Allison is a professor of history at Suffolk University. He's the author of several books on American history to include works on the Boston Massacre and the Boston Tea Party. Currently, he is chairman of Revolution, excuse me, Revolution 250, a consortium of more than 60 historical organizations in New England planning the commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution. At the conclusion of his talk, Professor Allison will answer questions. We ask that you send your questions through the Zoom chat and we will relay them. And now, Professor Bob Allison. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and thank you to the Worcester Historical Museum for making this event possible and for what you've been doing to curate the story of the revolution in Worcester. Uh, really an underrepresented story. Worcester really does loom large in the story of the revolution, less large in the public imagination of the American Revolution. We know about Boston's been, frankly, overrepresented, and one of the goals of Revolution 250 is to bring alive the stories of things that happened throughout the Commonwealth in places like Worcester. And I realized when you contacted me about the Hancock trunk and about the Hancock house that was in Worcester until the 1920s, that John Hancock is someone whose name looms large in our memory of the Revolution, but who also is somewhat forgotten. We know about his signature, it's hard to his escape his signature at the bottom of the Declaration of Independence, or his name that continues to be on buildings and streets throughout the nation. But Hancock himself remains somewhat elusive, which is something of a puzzle, because of all of the founders, Hancock is really one of the few who probably would have a political career today. That is, he had the political skills necessary to succeed in the 18th century or in the 21st century. He was actually not born to wealth. He was born to great respectability. His father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather were all ministers. And being a minister in 18th century Massachusetts was probably the most respectable occupation a man could have. And one of John Hancock's uncles also was a minister. His father, though, died when John Hancock was only about seven or eight years old. He was the minister in the town of Braintree, actually, in the part of Braintree that is now the city of Quincy. And his mother took him, along with his older sister Mary and the younger brother Ebenezer, first to live in Lexington with the in-laws, the Hancocks, who still were in the ministerial line. But then young John was sent to Boston to live with his uncle Thomas and his aunt Lydia, who could not have children. And Thomas was the only one of the Hancock brothers of his generation who did not go into the ministry. Instead, Thomas Hancock went into trade and he did very well in trade. By the time young John, about 10 years old, went to live with his uncle 
Thomas Hancock was perhaps the wealthiest man in Massachusetts. He had a house on the top of Beacon Hill and properties in other parts of Massachusetts, including a house in Worcester, a house you can see behind me that stood, as I said, until into the 1920s. So young John Hancock went to work for his uncle after graduating from the Boston Latin School and from Harvard in the class of 1754. And his uncle sent him to live in London for a year and a half to get better acquainted with the international trade that Thomas Hancock was deeply involved in. And there in London, young John Hancock's good manners, his expensive taste in dress, and a liberal purse made his way quite easily and helped him to I mean, win many good friends in the world of trade in London. And then he came back home, again, working in the uncle's firm. And then in 1763, when John was about in his early 20s, he became a partner in the uncle's firm. And then suddenly, in 1764, his uncle Thomas, who was a member of the governor's council, was entering into the council chamber in the old state house when suddenly he was afflicted with a stroke and he died. And John Hancock was his only heir. This left John Hancock at the age of 27, the inheritor of a fortune of about 70,000 pounds, which would be the equivalent of about 10 million pounds today, or about $13 million, making this young man one of the wealthiest in Massachusetts, as well as head of the firm, the firm of Thomas Hancock, which Thomas Hancock managed both from his wharf on Boston's waterfront and from the mansion he had at the top of Beacon Hill. And it was a life John Hancock moved relatively easily into as a man in his mid to late 20s. And quite likely he would have continued his mercantile trade, even though according to some who have studied his life, he wasn't really a skilled merchant. He was a very good politician. In 1768, John Hancock had a sloop, the Liberty, which came into Boston, carrying in its cargo some 25 casks of Madeira wine. However, the wine wasn't reported as being aboard. Wine had to be taxed. And there are conflicting stories about what happened aboard the Liberty on the night of May the 10th of 1768 a tidesman came on from the custom house. And according to the story that emerged later, he was locked into a cabin and told on the pain of death, he could not come out of the cabin and nor could he report on what was happening while he was locked in the cabin. Of course, he wouldn't know what was happening, except he could hear the sound of casks of Madeira being offloaded from the ship and then rowed ashore by tenders and taken to the Hancock Wharf and they're secured away out of the sight of revenue officers. That was the story in May. So Hancock Sloop Liberty unloaded its Madeira and then loaded a cargo of pitch and other goods so that it would cover the fact that it had just brought in a cargo of untaxed goods. Now, according to Thomas Kirk, the tidesman, about a month after this event, the fellow who had charged him or or had said, if you tell anyone what happened, I will kill you, died. And this empowered Thomas Kirk then to tell the truth. Of course, if you're on John Hancock's side of things, you say, this isn't the truth at all. The truth is there was no Madeira aboard and Kirk never was locked inside the cabin. That's a ludicrous story. However, on Kirk's evidence, the court of Ad the, uh, Benjamin Hollowell and Richard Harrison, the customs officers in Boston, ordered the liberty seized. And it actually was seized by sailors from the HMS Romney, a British warship that was in Boston Harbor, making sure that the revenue laws were enforced. And when some of the members of the Sons of Liberty saw the Liberty, the Liberty, the vessel, being towed out to the Romney, they jumped into boats and rowed after it, trying to prevent its seizure. They were unsuccessful, and the Liberty was tied up next to the Romney, where it could not be pried away by Boston's Sons of Liberty. Now, the Sons of Liberty could not recapture the Liberty, but what they could do was attack Hollowell and Harrison and other customs officers when they came ashore. 
which they did. There was a great riot, according to Governor Francis Bernard, and Hallowell was nearly killed by the mob, hitting him with a brick bat. His son had his skull cracked open by someone in this fray. And according to part of the story Bernard doesn't tell, other townspeople came to the rescue of these customs agents. This riot in June of 1768, touched off by the seizure of the liberty, would be one of the pretexts for the British government later that year sending troops to keep the peace in Boston. If revenue officers aren't safe from the vengeance of the mob, who would be? And Hollowell's windows were broken, a sloop that Harrison had purchased and was tied up at Long Wharf actually was pulled out of the water by the mob, dragged to Boston Common, and set on fire as a sign of protest. This isn't a group of people carrying signs. These are people really intent on doing serious damage to the law here. Now, Hancock, after the riot died down, entered into negotiations with the customs officers to try to recover the liberty. That was the real thing he wanted out of this, was to get his sloop back so it could go back to trading. He agreed to pay the duties on the 25 casks of Madeira, as well as the fine he was being charged for trying to get away without paying his tax. However, James Otis, a fiery lawyer in Boston, and defender of the prerogative of Massachusetts, and Samuel Adams, who was emerging as a real political leader in Boston, the leader of the Boston town meeting, squelched this idea. They were shocked at the very thought that John Hancock would want to negotiate with the British Crown and with these customs officers. So Hancock abandoned his discussions with Governor Bernard and with the customs operatives in Boston. Now, the Customs Board then decided to go after John Hancock in court and to get him really where it would hurt him most. They charged him with running goods ashore, with failing to post a bond for the goods he was bringing in, and for unloading a cargo without permission. Hancock's lawyer was John Adams. John Adams was a very, very good lawyer, also from Braintree, what is now Quincy, and Adams was emerging as the real defender of the interests that for want of a better word, we'll call the Patriots, they would have called themselves the Whigs, those opposed to the centralized power of the British administration. And Hancock was able to, I'm sorry, Adams was able to stall the legal proceedings, even though on the 17th of August, the Vice Admiralty Court ordered that the Liberty be forfeited, that Hancock forfeit this vessel. And the Liberty then was purchased actually by Harrison who was on behalf of the Board of Customs. Harrison, of course, had lost his own vessel, but he's not recovering the Liberty in order to replace his sailboat, which had been destroyed. The Liberty becomes a, a revenue customs cutter, and ultimately it is burned by people against the revenue system down in Newport, Rhode Island. Now, the prosecutor in Boston, Jonathan Sewell, at the same time as the Crown, or I should say the customs officers are beginning their proceedings against Hancock, the prosecutor, Jonathan Sewell, tries to move against the rioters, tries to have some of the rioters, those who had caused this great riot, who had broken Hallowell's windows, destroyed Harrison's boat, inflicted bodily harm on Harrison and Hallowell. He tries to have them prosecuted for rioting. However, he found that the sympathy in Boston was so much on the side of the rioters that he couldn't. He could get an indictment, but nothing more. So with no way of punishing the rioters and with Adams successfully, trying, successfully stalling prosecutions against Hancock and the liberty now seized, still wanting to do something, the English Attorney General advised the Customs Board that they really should bring criminal proceedings against Hancock, along with other members of his crew. So Hancock and five of his men, including Captain Daniel Malcolm, and Daniel Malcolm today is buried on Copps Hill in Boston. He, he died just shortly after all of this, and he wanted to be buried at least 10 feet down so he would be beyond the reach of any British revenue officer. Kind of an interesting thing, because Malcolm's brother, John was a British revenue officer. In fact, John Malcolm in 1774 would be tarred and feathered by the Boston mob for being a British revenue officer. So Hancock, 
Malcolm, four others are charged with smuggling. And the Crown sought a penalty of 9,000 pounds against them. This was three times the value of the wine that Hancock had landed. This would be the equivalent of about one and a half million pounds today. So a significant fine that the Crown is seeking against John Hancock and the bail was set at 3,000 pounds. So again, over a million pounds as a fine and 300, 400,000 pounds or so as a, um, the bail. Trial opened on the 7th of November, Adams defended, and Adams, very good lawyer, and one thing a good lawyer can do is forestall a prosecution. And Adams is able to stall things sufficiently that the Crown isn't able actually to find any witnesses as to what Hancock had done, and thus ultimately the proceedings are dropped against Hancock. This turns Hancock into a public figure. He's become now, he's a very wealthy young man. A young man without, he hasn't really taken a strong political stand. He wanted to hold on to his vessel. However, now he is part of this broader opposition to British revenue laws. Henry Halton, one of the British customs officers, says that Hancock was a subordinate character to the group that Halton calls the faction, those violently opposed to the British revenue measures, and that Hancock had fallen into the hands of designing bad men by whom he meant people like Samuel Adams and James Otis. And he was made a prey of and became a dupe to their party. They drew him in to give a sanction to all their wicked measures. That is having John Hancock as part of this group gave it a certain luster, which it would not otherwise have. And they also made use of his purse to further their schemes. And they consumed his substance upon the adherence of faction and in supporting sedition and treason. One man's sedition and treason and another's patriotism and Whiggism, but that's a story, I, well, I guess that is the story for today. Now, in the wake of this, Hancock is elected to the Massachusetts Assembly as one of the representatives from Boston. And he's also elected a Boston selectman. That is, he's now become a political figure, someone very much in vogue or someone very much wanted by the populace to be their representative. The following year, 1770, he chaired the town committee that would look into or investigate the happenings on March the 5th of 1770, the event that Samuel Adams would call the Bar Horrid Massacre. Hancock chairs the committee. He's not actually writing the report, which seems to have been more guided by Samuel Adams and Joseph Warren the physician from Roxbury, who's one of the intellectual leaders of this movement. And then in 1773, as a member of the assembly, Hancock will take part in publishing the letters of Thomas Hutchinson, an episode that will destroy Governor Hutchinson. And then Hancock was asked in 1774 to give the annual oration commemorating the massacre. The commemoration of the Boston Massacre had been an event the town of Boston held to keep alive the memory of what the town believed happened on the 5th of March of 1770. And Hancock, when the assembly was suspended by Governor Hutchinson in the, in the wake of the destruction of the tea, Hancock was the, a member of the Provincial Congress, which replaced it, and in fact would be chosen president of the Provincial Congress. Who better to preside than someone like Hancock. And John Hancock actually had a great gift as a presiding officer because he knew how to sidestep controversy. He was not a controversialist, not an ideologue. And he was someone who did want, genuinely wanted to get along with everybody. He had an easy temper and a smooth manner, something which will go a long way in public life then and now. Now, at the same time, he was chosen to be chairman of the Committee of Safety, the uh, enterprise really started to protect the safety of the people of Massachusetts against the coming war that was going to be waged. By the way, he was also the treasurer of Harvard College, his alma mater, and who better to be treasury than someone with a fabulous fortune as John Hancock had. Hancock, though, was not, as I said, a really good, good businessman, certainly not as good as his uncle was. 
and he was somewhat sloppy in his bookkeeping. So it becomes a running issue with Harvard College, the fact that Hancock, the treasurer, is keeping in his personal possession the bonds and other securities that are held by the college. And there's going to become, become a point when the college really wants to have those things back. Now, at the same time, Hancock is also courting Dorothy Quincy, a young woman from, again, Braintree, although now the city of Quincy, and of course the city of Quincy now is named for the Quincy family, of which Dorothy is a member. She's a daughter of Edmund Quincy, or Squire Quincy, one of the many Quincys there. In fact, she's one of nine children. Her older sister, Esther, in fact, is married to Jonathan Sewell, the prosecutor who had brought the, tried to bring the suit against the rioters and later would be bringing actions against others. She's about 10 years younger than he is. So she's in her mid-20s. He's in his mid-30s as they are courting. And it happens, their courtship, coincide. Part of their courtship coincides with the battles of Lexington and Concord. And Hancock, John Hancock, is in Lexington at a home of some relative, now the Hancock Clark House in Lexington. In fact, the only building that still has a connection to John Hancock. His uncle had left him with properties, including the one on Beacon Hill and the one in Worcester. There were other family houses all have been raised. The one on Beacon Hill raised in 1863, the one in Worcester in the 1920s, the Hancock Clark House in Lexington still stands. And it was there on the 19th of April of 1775 when John Hancock tells his fiancee, Dorothy Quincy, that she cannot go back to Boston to, be, uh, to rejoin her family. And she tells him quite pointedly, you must remind, I must remind you, Mr. Hancock, that I am not yet under your control. And she does go back to be with her relatives in Boston. John Hancock goes out to Worcester. He and Samuel Adams go and they stay in this house in Worcester on the night of April the 26th, just about a few days after Lexington and Concord. Remember the trunk that the Worcester Historical Museum owns was also in the Hancock Clark House in Lexington. It had to be carried out by Paul Revere and John Lowell. This was a heavy trunk. It still is a heavy trunk, I understand. Then it was filled with papers, papers from the Provincial Congress, the Committee of Safety, perhaps from the Continental Congress too. Samuel Adams was a member of the Continental Congress. And this is exactly the kind of information you would not want to to have fallen into the hands of the regiment that had come out to Lexington to find the munitions stored at Concord and possibly to arrest John Hancock. Hancock and Adams return from this house in Worcester to Philadelphia to the Continental Congress meeting in Philadelphia. And there Hancock was elected to preside over the Congress. Peyton Randolph of Virginia, who had presided at the first session, had left Congress, and now John Hancock of Massachusetts is chosen to succeed him. And Massachusetts, of course, had been at the forefront of the movement for independence. And it made sense to have a person of wealth like Hancock, just as it made sense to have a person of wealth like Randolph sitting in the chair, showing that this is not a rebellion by the rabble, but really by the merchants and the planters, by people of substance. Hancock was president of Congress, but most of Congress's work was actually done in committees. John Adams was involved in many of the committees of Congress, as was Samuel Adams and as was Benjamin Franklin. And the president, well, it's very awkward for a college professor to say someone else doesn't have a whole lot to do, but the president of the Congress did preside. Today, of course, a president, we think of that as an office having great power. 18th century, the idea of a president is someone who presides over a deliberative body that uh, may or may not do something. Now, Hancock's wealth and his prestige had attracted people like the Adamses, thinking, wouldn't it be good to have someone like this in our orbit? But then it turns out his ostentation seemed to irritate the Adamses. Now, again, we have to approach this with some trepidation. The Adamses sour on John Hancock during this period, although I should say the public in Massachusetts 
does not. And much of the historical record about Hancock was written by Adams. Is in fact, the biographical entry on John Hancock in the Dictionary of American Biography was written by an Adams. It's kind of a strange choice to have the, someone from the family that really didn't like the guy writing his biography, but we can't control who lives, who dies, who tells our story, as the song says. Now, while Hancock is president of Congress, actually a tutor from Harvard shows up in Philadelphia because Harvard wants the securities and other things that Hancock was holding on behalf of the college. He does give them some 16,000 pounds worth of securities that he's holding, which isn't all that he has from Harvard. Harvard doesn't actually get the rest, and I don't want you to think this is special pleading on behalf of Harvard and John Hancock until after Hancock's death, but Harvard does in June of 1777 replace him as treasurer with someone else. Now, of course, one of the big things that Congress does in 1775, and I apologize for the digression into Harvard politics, is prepare to have a continental army. In fact, at this time, after the alarm at Lexington and the battle at Concord, there are some 10 to 20,000 militia troops from throughout New England surrounding Boston, from Cambridge to Roxbury, keeping the British forces penned up in the town of Boston and the British fleet in Boston Harbor. And of course, the government of Massachusetts is really keen to have someone else take responsibility for these 20,000 or so men, armed men, camping out in this whole entire area. And so Massachusetts really wants these militia troops who are from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, as well as some from Virginia and Pennsylvania and other places, really want someone to step in who can control them make them a continental army. The Connecticut troops won't listen to the Massachusetts government. The Massachusetts troops won't listen to officers from Connecticut or New Hampshire or Rhode Island. The Virginia troops won't listen to anybody. We really need to turn this into an army that will have some discipline and control. I think we can appreciate this problem. And so Congress has begun debating how to form this as a continental army. John Adams, as Congress is debating the creation of a Continental Army, tells the members of Congress, as we are debating how to create a Continental Army, we also need to give serious thought to who will command this army. I have someone in mind. Of course, everyone immediately wants to know who that someone is. Someone who has military experience. Well, John Hancock had been commander of the first Corps of Cadets, one of the military units in Boston. Actually, a military unit made up of other men like Hancock, successful merchants, the first Corps of Cadets. And Hancock, of course, was the commander of it. Someone who is known and respected throughout the colonies. John Hancock is president of the Continental Congress. Hancock, who is a relatively small man, is sitting up taller in his chair as presiding officer, as he's now hearing John Adams check off the qualifications to be commander of the Continental Army. And someone who has a large fortune, which he has already committed to this cause. Well, of course, John Hancock has committed his large fortune to this cause. Adams can see out of one eye, Hancock sitting up taller in his chair. Out of his other, he can see sitting by the door, looking increasingly uncomfortable, and, incidentally, wearing his uniform as Colonel of the Virginia Regiment, George Washington of Virginia. And Washington, according to Adams's diary, had arrived in Congress wearing his uniform. And Washington said it was a sign that the time for talking is over, the time for fighting has begun. And Washington had been very busy on the committees to plan the Continental Army, as well as to plan for the defenses of New York. And Adam said, the person I have in mind is George Washington of Virginia. And with that, Washington got up and left the room. Hancock's face froze, and he never forgave John Adams. And immediately, Samuel Adams rose to second the motion. Both of the Adamses realized that even though this is a New England army, 
And that, of course, was a selling point for Hancock to command it. New Englanders would want to be commanded by a New Englander. And remember, in New England, soldiers chose their own officers. The Adamses realized that for the revolution to succeed, Virginia really needed to be seen as leading it. And so Washington was their choice. Hancock, of course, believed he should have been their choice. And I should say that Hancock forgives George Washington. In fact, two years later, when he and Dorothy have their, fur, their only son, they name him John George Washington Hancock. What a legacy that would be for a child to live up to. So Hancock does not become the commander of the Continental Army. He does later that summer marry Dorothy Quincy in Fairfield, Connecticut. And then the following year, their only daughter, Lydia, is born. She dies after about eight short months of life. The same year that his daughter, Lydia, dies, Hancock signs the Declaration of Independence. Of course, as president of Congress, the first printed copies of the Declaration have only John Hancock's signature, along with the signature of Benjamin Thompson, the clerk of the Congress. And then later that summer, when the parchment copy is created, Hancock affixes his large signature to it. The apocryphal story is he wanted to sign it large enough so that the king could read it without his glasses. Hancock did have a large signature throughout his life, which I suppose a psychologist would read more into, but it's a very clear handwriting, and certainly a great statement of who John Hancock is. So Hancock signs the declaration and the same, and then he does return to Massachusetts. In fact, he continues to serve as the president of Congress in 1776 and 1777, even though he does not attend. Another persistent pattern in Hancock's career is legislative bodies elect him their presiding officer, even when he is not there. He seemed to be someone they wanted to preside, even if he was not actually presiding. In 1777, in October, he resigned as president of Congress, and Samuel Adams actually blocked a motion to thank John Hancock for his service. A persistent pattern here between the Adamses and Hancock of not wanting to recognize the other. And he does get a chance, John Hancock does get a chance in 1778 to command troops, Massachusetts troops. He leads to the Battle of Rhode Island, which does not go well. And this is the same year that he and Dorothy have their son, John George Washington Hancock. Back in Massachusetts, Hancock's business really had ended, and he is very much a public figure. And as a public figure, he maintains his position, his popularity, by benefiting the public. His home on Beacon Hill becomes a place to go for firewood in the winter or for punch on different occasions. He entertains quite lavishly at his home on Beacon Hill, something that is generally going to win one friends at election time. And in 1780, he's a member of the Constitutional Convention that drafts Massachusetts's Constitution, which is still Massachusetts's Constitution, the oldest functioning written constitution in the world. And then he is elected the first governor of Massachusetts. Massachusetts, by the way, is the only state which has a governor elected by a popular vote. And Massachusetts's Constitution also requires that the governor be really wealthy. He has to have an annual income of about a thousand pounds. And it's one of the reasons Massachusetts is one of only five states which does not give the governor an official residence. Our thinking is, by the way, you no longer need to be really, really wealthy to be governor, although typically we do elect someone who is. The presumption is the governor will have his or her own house. And Hancock certainly does on the top of Beacon Hill, the Hancock House where he and Dorothy can entertain and can have visitors and can very much be seen. It is on the highest point in the town of Boston. And he is reelected every year. 
And then in 1785, stricken by gout again, um, he resigned in that November, even though he was not in Philadelphia or in, in Baltimore at the, Constant, at the Continental Congress, he was elected to be its presiding officer. In fact, he resigned from Congress in March of 1786. And in that time, he had been the presiding officer. He never is actually in attendance. Now, this period, 1785 and 86, when John Hancock is out of power is also the time when, sadly, tragically, their son, John, falls through the ice when he is skating on a pond in Milton and drowns. This eight-year-old boy drowns, and the Hancocks are left childless. It's also the time of Shays' rebellion in Massachusetts, the uh, rebellion of taxpayers in the western part of the state against the entrenched power, as they see it, of the eastern elite, the uh, merchants of Boston and of Salem who are usurping their own role and extorting taxes from the folks out west, just the way they saw as people back in the 1760s had been extorted by the British crown very much against the embattled farmers of Western Massachusetts in 1786 and 87 is Samuel Adams, who doesn't believe that anyone can rebel against an elected government. We rebelled, he said, against a government that we did not hear us, that did not represent us. But now we've elected this government, which taxes us. How can you resist that? It was somewhat of a, a compelling argument, not compelling enough to get the farmers of Western Massachusetts to put down their guns and not to disrupt the courts, which of course they had done in Worcester in 1774 and other places. And the Massachusetts government sends troops to the western part of the state to put down the rebellion, fighting the Shays army, the army of Daniel Shays outside of the arsenal at Springfield, and then chasing this army through the snow to Peterson, New Hampshire, Peterson Massachusetts, and in January, February of 1787, putting down this rebellion and the rebels flee across the border into New Hampshire and to other places. In the wake of this, the Massachusetts government is seeking the death penalty against these rebels. Remember, Samuel Adams didn't see how people could rebel against the people's government. And James Bowden, the governor who had put down the rebellion, is really adamant about forcing these people to pay. And what happens in April of 1787 is that the voters of Massachusetts go to the polls and they turn out almost the entire legislature that had enacted the high taxes that had pushed these people in the western part of the state to rebellion. They replace them with more tender-minded folks who recognized that these veterans of the war had serious grievances and that the state should not be extorting tax revenues from them. And also they replaced James Bowden with John Hancock as governor. Hancock gets about three quarters of the vote. It is the most lopsided gubernatorial election in the history of Massachusetts. As John Hancock is elected, and the one consistency, one of the consistencies in John Hancock's public life was a desire to be liked or loved by those who elected him. And so Hancock as governor suspends the sentences against those who had been charged with treason and other hanging offenses, pardons those who had been caught up in Shays' rebellion, and oversees a legislature that rescinds the taxes imposed by its predecessor. And this is something at which Hancock is gifted. The ability to see the real end here isn't necessarily to punish those misguided folks who were rebelling, but to listen to their complaints and also to see to it that the Republic survives, not through the strong arm of the law, but through, well, shall we say, a more conciliatory policy. Now, at the same time, of course, Shays Rebellion triggers across the other states an understanding that something needs to be done to change this system so that we won't have rebellions cropping up in states over this issue of taxation. So in the summer of 1787, as I'm sure you're aware, a constitutional convention assembles in Philadelphia and drafts a new constitution of the United States. And in order for this new constitution to take effect, it has to be ratified 
by nine of the 13 states. And had we been placing bets in the fall of 1787 about whether this would happen, I think the smart money would have been, no, it won't. Because the Constitution, the new proposed Constitution, seemed to give too much power to a central government, taking power away from state governments. And among those most vociferous against it were people who had spent most of their lives fighting against a concentration of power in the British government. Now, Samuel Adams, who had opposed the Shazites, also opposes the new constitution. He wrote to Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, another of the old revolutionaries of 1774, five and six. I confess, as I enter the building, I stumble at the threshold. The phrase, we the people of the United States, really got to Samuel Adams. Who are the people of the United States? How can you have that this big a country under one government. Samuel Adams opposes ratifying the Constitution, as does Elbridge Gerry. In fact, Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts was one of the delegates who stayed throughout the summer of 1787 and then refused to sign the Constitution when it was finished. And he has become the expert witness for the Massachusetts legislature on what the Constitution means. And he also will be a witness for the state ratifying convention. And at the convention that gathers in Boston in January of 1788, this is one of the largest gather, largest legislative bodies, largest conventions held in any of the states. There are about 18 to 20 people who had been with Daniel Shays's army at the beginning of the previous year. These are real opponents of centralized power. And there are towns in Maine and towns in the western part of Massachusetts which hadn't sent a representative to the general court, but now do send someone to this constitutional convention, and they don't like this concentration of power that this new government seems to be promising, or I should say threatening. Now, the convention also elected John Hancock as its presiding officer, and Hancock recognizing that if he came out against the Constitution, he would earn himself many enemies. And if he came out in support of the Constitution, he would earn himself many other memories, enemies stayed away. And his gout flared up, which often happened when he was faced with a moment of crisis. So he stays ensconced at his house on Beacon Hill as the convention meets in the Long Lane Meeting House. And the convention deliberates on the Constitution line by line. And the supporters of the Constitution in Massachusetts realize they are probably going to lose. And if they lose in Massachusetts, that's the end. So they do something very wise. They call on Governor Hancock. And they do two things. One is they tell him the news from Virginia is Virginia is probably not going to ratify the Constitution. And if nine states do ratify, but Virginia is not one of them, George Washington cannot be president. The country will need a president, someone who is known, respected, dare we say loved, throughout the country, someone who can bring the nation together. And if not George Washington, Governor Hancock, who? do you think could do that? And the other thing they do is present Hancock a list of amendments that they say they could support. They want the Constitution ratified first, bring it into effect, and then add the amendments that the opponents say it needs, protections of individual liberties, the other things, what we know as the Bill of Rights, which was not part of the original Constitution. So in the waning days of the convention, Governor Hancock is carried in to the Long Lane Meeting House on a sedan chair, wrapped in gauze, still suffering from the gout. And he presents the convention with the amendments, which he says are his idea, that Massachusetts will support ratifying the Constitution because we recognize we need a stronger federal fabric to hold the Union together. But we also recognize that the opponents have legitimate ideas about ways to constrain that. 
Hancock presents the amendment but says we should ratify first. And by a vote of 187 in favor of ratification, 168 against, Massachusetts ratifies the federal constitution and submits amendments to be added later. Massachusetts will use her considerable prestige among the states to secure these amendments which the people demand and have a right to. This is one of the great moments in Hancock's career, securing the ratification of the Constitution in Massachusetts. Now, Governor Hancock, still governor, it's unlikely, I think, that he expected he could be elected president. He very much liked being governor of Massachusetts, and he was quite good at it. But in October of 1789, he faces another test, and this is with a visit to Boston of George Washington. Washington is making a tour of the New England states. And in October of 1789, he comes to Massachusetts. Actually, Rhode Island had not ratified the Constitution, so Washington stays away from Rhode Island on his tour of New England. And he does write to Governor Hancock that he is coming, and Governor Hancock invites him to stay at the Hancock House on Beacon Hill. But President Washington had developed, adopted a policy of not staying in private homes when he is on this national tour. And so Hancock is a bit disappointed not to have Washington as a guest. Washington's going to stay in a house, on, uh, actually in a tavern or an inn, a hotel on Tremont Street. And Washington gets to Han um, what is now Washington Street at Boston Neck, the road leading into Boston from Roxbury. And there he waits. He had told Governor Hancock he did not want a parade, which Hancock had offered him. What Washington doesn't know is that Governor Hancock and the selectmen of Boston are having an argument about who should welcome Washington into the city. Governor Hancock believes he should as the governor of the Commonwealth. The selectmen of Boston say, no, you should have welcomed him at the state border if you wanted to welcome him. We welcome him into Boston. And it's a cold, rainy day in October, and Washington is on his horse at Boston Neck, waiting for the welcoming committee. And across the lines in Boston, the selectmen are sitting in a carriage, Governor Hancock is sitting in a carriage, and they're sending messages back and forth about who is going to welcome Washington. And Washington is just turning his horse around and saying to his aides, there's, I know there's another road into town when a rider comes up to say, oh, we're ready for you, Mr. President. And so Washington rides into Boston and goes to his inn on Tremont Street, and then he waits for Governor Hancock to call on him. Now, Governor Hancock believes that since he is the governor of the Commonwealth, the president should visit him first. Washington believes that as president of the United States, the governor should call on him. This becomes very embarrassing because the two were supposed to have lunch the next day, but they can't until they've actually met in advance. These may seem like petty little things, but they're quite important in terms of federal state relations. And Hancock ultimately realizes that George Washington is not going to call on him. So he is brought down to Tremont Street and carried up the stairs into Washington's room to greet the president. Now, Washington is quite shocked at Hancock's appearance. Hancock's health has been failing. He does genuinely suffer from the gout and other health problems. And so it's not simply an excuse Hancock is making about failing to call on the president first. And this does manage to allay the grievances developing between the two as Hancock does ultimately greet Washington. And I should say that in 1799, one of John Hancock's nephews, also named John Hancock, will dine at Mount Vernon with George and Martha Washington. John Hancock himself stays in Boston, stays as the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and actually dies in office at the age of 56 in 1793. Broken health, a broken fortune. In fact, he had he, people are shocked that John Hancock is not the wealthiest man in Massachusetts. His fortune was long gone. It, in fact, it had been gone in the cause of American independence, where he had expended it. 
and his widow, Dorothy, would remarry and move to New Hampshire. Widowed again, she returns to Massachusetts and tries several times to give the Hancock Mansion to the Commonwealth as a governor's mansion. The Commonwealth rejects the gift, and in 1863, the Hancock Mansion is demolished, although Oliver Wendell Holmes says and so many pieces of it were purchased as souvenirs that the Hancock Mansion still exists, but it's in a thousand pieces. So we think about it, what is John Hancock's legacy? Someone whose name looms large, certainly, but few of us know much more about him or about his life. He is, as I said, perhaps one of the few who would have survived in the political world today. A, because he had the skills necessary to get along with people, to conciliate people, and to avoid controversy, but also because he had a large fortune, which is also helpful in securing support. We have to remember that this was a fortune he expended on our behalf, on behalf of the cause of American independence, and not for his own aggrandizement. So I'm really delighted to be able to join with you in talking a little bit about John Hancock and his legacy, and thank the Worcester Historical Museum for keeping it alive in the form of the Hancock trunk and the other programs you're offering as part of these 250th commemorations. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, comes up often in uh, accounts of revolutions or other major political movements is the nature of personal relationships and how personal relationships can be formed early on during a movement and then people will uh, uh, sort of depart for one reason or another, whether it's personal or ideological. Um, one of the things that um, I'm not sure whether it really happened, but you can, you can confirm this for us. Uh, I have read or heard that uh, there was actually a, a mentor relationship between Sam Adams and John Hancock. To what extent was that true? Well, certainly Samuel, you know, Samuel Adams was, had long experience in politics. And like John Hancock, Samuel Adams came from a merchant family in Boston. In fact, when Samuel Adams went to Harvard, he was fifth in his class. And that was at a time when class rank was determined by your family's social standing. Samuel Adams, though, was not at all interested in running his father's many businesses. He was interested in politics. And he really knew some, a lot about political organization and mobilization. So you're right. He does draw Hancock in and does serve as kind of a mentor to him. Is it mentor, is mentor though the right word? Is Samuel Adams real? And, and one of the difficult things about Samuel Adams, and by the way, I saw someone's comment that Hancock's a difficult man. I think Samuel Adams was quite a difficult man too. Samuel Adams was, he destroyed most of his papers. So he really can't recover this, much of what happened. I think Samuel Adams sees the value of someone like Hancock. And remember, until 1770 or so, Samuel Adams is very much behind the scenes, working through James Otis or others. In fact, Hancock, he sees, I think, as a front person because he would be much more acceptable to many more people than someone like Samuel Adams is. So he is bringing in Hancock, thinking he really can control him, and in some cases, he couldn't. Similarly, you know, John Adams comes, I wouldn't say distrustful of Hancock. In, in 1772 and three, there is an attempt by Governor Hutchinson to try to woo back John Hancock. And almost successful. And just as in 1768, when John Hancock tries to negotiate back the liberty, in this case, Hancock and Warren and others block Hancock from moving back toward the Crown Party. You know, so Hancock is in many ways um, brought into politics by Samuel Adams, but it's not going to, you know, Samuel Adams, of course, is about you know, more than 15 years older than John Hancock is. <clears throat> much more of a politician than John Hancock is. I'm sure this isn't answering your question. I'm just thinking about this kind of relationship. And you do see these 
relationships which break in a lot of ways as you know one person really cannot control another and if you're someone like john hancock you're independently wealthy and there must come a point when you see they really just want me to pay for everything which he was doing he was bankrolling all of this and it wasn't really his cause and he wins in the end by becoming governor but uh, ironically enough Samuel Adams is elected lieutenant governor in 1792 as to balance the ticket. And then when Hancock dies, Samuel Adams becomes governor. I don't know if Samuel Adams would have been elected governor because he was a much more controversial figure. And what the uh, thing about Hancock is he seems to be above you know, political squabbling. Yeah. Um, we had one question. I don't know if you um, got this uh, on your uh, on your laptop, but uh, I'll read the question. Um, we have. Uh, I appreciate the positive contributions made by Hancock, but at every point he strikes me as a difficult man. Yeah, you had uh, alluded to that. It says his disagreement over welcoming Washington is one example. He also became president of the Continental Pro Congress pro tem then refused to relinquish the seat when the previous holder returned. And uh, he says uh, his memory suggests yeah. Juan Rutledge of Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, I think that's a very good question. And again, I'm trying to be careful not simply to take the Adams's word for it, but Hancock was quite a vain person. I mean, you see the Gilbert Stuart, or, or, I'm sorry, the John Singleton Copley portrait of him. The outstanding thing about it is all of the gold he is wearing on his coat. And he is a person who seems to like this display. And of course, the Adamses are much more the um, old Puritans who believe in uh, not having this ostentation. Whereas John Hancock, you know, his father had been a congregational minister, but then his uncle was fabulously wealthy and John Hancock had spent time in London and didn't see anything wrong with the finer life. It's one reason he suffers from the gout is because he enjoys this life of, rel of luxury. So, yeah, and when John Mean, the editor, attacks him, real Hancock really goes after him. He you know, could say he's thin-skinned, doesn't like criticism, but then again, who does? And again, if, you're th if you think about it, and what John Hancock is doing is offering himself to the public, and here someone in the public is attacking him, naturally he'll get a little upset particularly if John Mean is on the other side. So Samuel Adams sees Mean and the other Tory printers and others as the focus of evil. So, of course, if they're attacking you, John Hancock, you're not going to like this. It's a very good question. And, you know, since I know you wanted the positive John Hancock, I tried to stay away from Hancock, the guy who is full of himself is extraordinarily egotistical, you know, lives in the biggest house in Boston on the top of a hill, looking down on everyone else, which by definition you do when you live on top of a, the highest point in the town. And so, yeah, uh, and so I, I, I definitely could agree with, I hate to sound like John Hancock, both agreeing with those who love him and those who would hate him, but um, it's the nature of the thing. Someone also asked if he lived with his uncle in the house in Worcester. No, his uncle had gone to his great reward by the time John Hancock got out to the house in Worcester. And Hancock winds up selling the house to Stephen Salisbury uh, sometime in this period. And Salisbury um, builds his house, I believe. But you, can, you know more about the Salisbury house than I do, and I'm embarrassed to mention it since you are the curator of it. But um, Salisbury builds a bigger house. It's a relatively modest house in Worcester that Hancock, the Hancocks owned. And I suspect Uncle Thomas owned other properties around, which typically would have been rental properties and not, here's a, you know, in case you need a weekend getaway in Worcester, you have this nice house. We have uh, one more question. Um, is it truth behind the lore that uh, Hancock purchased a new suit for Samuel Adams, uh, that he offered some sort of bail money to help Sam Adams and provided a formal allowance to Sam Adams? I would say yes, because Samuel Adams didn't know how to dress. And he, okay, Samuel Adams, think about public perception. And the public perception of, of John Hancock is he is fabulously wealthy. The public perception, perception of Samuel Adams is 
he is so focused on what is right. He pays no attention to these extraneous things like how you dress and so on. Um, and although John Adams does note, when he goes to dine at Samuel Adams's house, Samuel Adams always knows which fork to use, which John Adams, the country cousin from Braintree, does not. Okay, but John Hancock does buy new clothes for Samuel Adams, and Samuel Adams' house is going to be seized by the sheriff. Uh, Samuel Adams was elected as a tax collector, and he was a very popular tax collector because he never collected taxes. Now, the presumption is if you're a tax collector and you never send in your tax receipts, we don't think it's because you're a nice guy, it's because you're keeping it. So the legislature says, okay, anyone who doesn't send in their tax receipts will seize their property. And that includes the home of Samuel Adams, which is going to be put up for auction. And John Hancock bails him out, ultimately, after the Sons of Liberty for prevent the sheriff from coming on the scene. This is what Henry Holton meant by Sam John Hancock being used by these guys. And then, of course, when Ad John Samuel Adams goes off to Philadelphia, he doesn't know how to ride a horse. Remember, he lives in the city. There's no reason to know how to ride a horse. So he has to not only be provided with a horse, but learn how to ride it. And these are all things that the money of John Hancock can really make easier. So, so it is really his fortune as opposed to his ideas. I should say that James Truslow Adams, who wrote the short biography of John Hancock in the Dictionary of American Biography, goes on and on about Hancock's mediocrity and says he was very popular among those who didn't know him well enough to see how mediocre he was. Of course, I'm in no position to criticize anyone else for being mediocre, but apparently James Truslow, Ad the Adamses had no compunctions about that. So um, yeah, poor John Hancock, uh, and he's quite popular. And, uh, and his popularity for Samuel Adams, at least, seemed to be directly connected to his bank account. One final question. Uh, did Hancock meet George III during his time in London? No. Okay. Uh, no, very few people would meet George III. His time there did overlap, I believe, with the coronation, and I'm sorry for not knowing whether he attended that. Benjamin Franklin attended the coronation, um, seated way up in the balcony of Westminster Abbey, and uh, was very proud of the fact that his son, uh, William Franklin was in the royal procession coming in. Uh, but to my knowledge, no, John Hancock did not meet George III, being the wealthiest son, the heir of the wealthiest merchant in Massachusetts, means a lot in Massachusetts. It doesn't necessarily mean so much in London, but I will look into that and will let you know if in fact I am wrong. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, we wanna thank you, Professor Allison. And uh, once again, we'd like to, uh, extend our gratitude to the Worcester Arts Council, a local agency and the Mass Cultural Council, and uh, also the Worcester Together Fund, and uh, the United Way of Central Massachusetts, uh, which is one of the uh, component parts of the uh, Greater Worcester community. Also uh, at this time, we want to thank Digital Worcester and WPI, and we encourage all of you who participated tonight in uh, joining our virtual tour of Revolutionary Worcester. And we hope in the future to resume our actual walking tours of Worcester. Uh, we started at the Salisbury Mansion and went down Main Street and then uh, explored a number of sites that were important. And uh, also to learn more about Worcester and the American Revolution, uh, we encourage you to uh, visit uh, www.worcesterhistory.org to access that citywide tour, uh, the town that defied an empire. And also please be sure to follow Worcester Historical Museum on Facebook and Instagram for more fascinating Worcester history and updates on our future programs. Uh, because of the pandemic, our um, manner of outreach has changed significantly. We are devoting a great deal of time and effort towards reaching as many people as possible uh, and we seem to be succeeding. We had people from as far away as Oklahoma and Pennsylvania tonight. Uh, and uh, please check out our webpage. Thank you for attending and uh, have a good night. Thank you.